Well, I All right, guys, if you want to go ahead and come on in, grab your seat, and we'll go ahead and get started. Are you guys full? Did you guys get enough food? Uh, that's awesome. Did you guys meet a dinosaur or two out there? Uh, praise God. Well, thank you guys for coming back tonight, and I will tell you this, um, very much a joy to see these wonderful families fellowshipping together, spending time, laughing smiling, and just enjoying this evening together. And guys, what a great picture of what church, the body of Christ, is intended to be. Just this right here, coming together and enjoying fellowship. And guys, tonight, another opportunity to take a few more steps down the road and getting equipped. And I hope you were encouraged this morning. The Bible has great answers to some of the great questions our world is asking. And tonight, guys, a really fun and unique opportunity 
How do dinosaurs relate to the biblical account of creation? And as well, remember, there's a Q&A coming up at the end of our time. So be thinking if there's a question that you've always wanted to ask. This is a great time and a great place to ask it. So would you guys join me as we pray? And we'll go ahead and bring up Scott Gillis. Father, thank you so much for what's already been a really fun and meaningful time to fellowship together, to enjoy a great meal, Lord God, and just to get to know one another. And we just pray that that fellowship would continue as we come and as we sit under the teaching of your word. We invite your Holy Spirit, fall fresh upon our hearts, lead us into all truth, bless Scott as he guides our time, and we're just looking forward to all that you have in store for us. We want to be a church that is equipped to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. We dedicate this time to you now, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Gang, welcome again, Scott Gillis. All right, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back here. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, dinosaurs. How many people like dinosaurs? Okay. How many people are terrified of dinosaurs? Okay, got a few of those. A few of those. Well, the information that we're talking about can be found on a, a number of locations. Creation Magazine, somebody did ask me if you could still subscribe tonight. There are forms in the back. That would be awesome to get that in your family. And also, you can find it on our website, which everybody knows is what? All right, so let's talk about dinosaurs in the Bible. And you might think, what? I mean, why would we talk about dinosaurs in church? But how many people here have heard the idea that dinosaurs roamed the earth over 65 million years ago? Right? But you see, it is important to deal with this because if dinosaurs exactly did that and lived millions of years ago, then the Bible's history, as it's plainly taught in Scripture, can't be true. And that's why we need to do. Also, if the evolutionary timeline of millions of years and everything is true, then that would mean that we're just a more highly evolved animal, okay? That, that there would be no absolute truth, because if the Bible isn't true, how do we know what is true and what isn't? Noah's flood would be a myth that man merely wrote the Bible. And then guess who decides what's the difference between right and wrong if evolution is true? We do, all right? Now, like I said, we are going to talk about dinosaurs today, but we're going to do it maybe in a different way than you maybe ever have before, because we're going to use the Bible as our starting point. Okay, we're going to use what's called a biblical world view. Has anybody ever heard of a world view? Right? You know, for example, I can explain it this way. Um, that right now I can tell you that standing back there in the sound booth, there's a man. But wait, just a minute. Well, I'm pretty sure it's a man. But I can tell you right now that if that is a man, I know for a fact, based on what I'm seeing, he has no eyes, no nose, and no mouth. <coughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Oh. I was wrong. He does have eyes, nose, and a mouth. He's a very handsome man. <laughs> however, however, did anything change about him? No. no, what changed is that the light that was reflecting off of his face was coming into the back of my retina, but I added something. I added these glasses, okay? The glasses allowed me to focus, I'm going to call it the data or the information into my retina. So a worldview is kind of like glasses, you might say. Uh, it's the way we look. And if we look at dinosaurs through evolutionary glasses, okay, of course we're going to see millions of years of death, extinction, tumors, and even cancer. We've actually located cancer not only in fossils in general, but specifically dinosaur fossils. But as I said, tonight we're going to look at dinosaurs through biblical glasses and hopefully answer some questions that you have or maybe questions you didn't even know that you have. We'll answer those too. So here's a pop quiz. What is this species? Or what is the name of this dinosaur? Exactly. Now, a more challenging question is when did Triceratops live? I'm going to make it easier for you. Multiple choice. Was it 65 million years ago? Or ding, the Mesozoic or the Jurassic? Or maybe we won't know until we get to heaven. Okay, well remember, we're using biblical glasses to answer this question. We're going to use the Bible as our starting point, and we do know the answer of that according to the Bible. 
In Genesis chapter 20, there, this is where the Ten Commandments are, are. And in that place, on the uh, commandment about the Sabbath, it says that in six days God created the heavens and earth and everything that's in them. And by the way, the, Greek, the Hebrew word for everything means everything. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> So there were six days of creation. Now, more, more quiz, and I need people to raise their hand if they know the answer. So keep in mind that it, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so that, that's like everything. And then he specifically goes through each of the six days of creation and names specifically what God creates on each day. So does somebody know what he created on day one specifically? I need a little louder or a little clearer here. Yes, a young lady in the back that raised her hand. Raise your hand. Go ahead. I'm sorry, can you say it louder? Not sure. Okay, light is the correct answer. You are right. He, he separated the light, the light and the darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness night. Now, the next one's a little harder. On day two, what did he specifically create? Do you know, ma'am? Do you know? All the earth and the sun and the moon, a little too early. We're not quite there yet. All right. And by the way, this can be an open book test if you want. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have day two for me that really knows? Yes. Yes, young lady. What'd you say? No, not night. Night, that night would have been the day the light was created on day one. Yes, young man. Yes. You got it. He separated the waters from below to the waters above. He created what we call an expanse, and we can talk about what that means later. Woo, got that one. Awesome. Day two. Okay, day three. Again, it can be an open book test. You guys are answering with so much confidence here. It's day three. Oh, yes. Young man, do you know? No, you're day early. Yes, yes young man. Okay, that's very good. I'm going to accept that. He separated the land from the water. He said he brought the water into one place and land appeared. And then after that, he created something else on the land, specifically. And that is the plants, trees, vegetation. All right. Now, there's a couple people in this room that are really waiting for day four because they've already answered day four. So does anybody want to guess what day four, what God specifically created? Yes, ma'am? Yes. Stars, you're right. The celestial bodies, the, the, the stars, the moon, the sun. Okay, day five. Yes, sir? That is correct, but specifically which animals? Not all the animals. Do you know which ones? If I give you a picture, will it help? Swimming and flying things, okay? So those, specifically. And then on day six, he first created what? Yes, do you know? He did create humans on six, day six. You are correct, but before he created humans? Land animals. Land animals, all right. Whew, we got through that one. Okay, we made it. All right, now, back to our question. According to the Bible, when did Triceratops live? Day six. All dinosaurs, by the way, are land animals, despite what some people tell you on television, but they are. Now, you might be thinking, we have a problem here. Because on day six, he created both land animals, which would include dinosaurs, and what? Man. Man. This would say it's not separated by 65 million years old. Do we have any evidence for that? I don't know if this is a reliable source, but <laughs> remember, Jesus said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? So we need to understand what God says about all things on earth, including dinosaurs, in order to understand the entire piece of scripture. Okay, another pop quiz. Okay, what species is this? You are absolutely right. That is T-Rex. Now... 
A more difficult question. What did the first T-Rex eat? Again, I'm going to make it multiple choice. Was it meat or plants or meat and plants or something completely different? Okay. <laughs> now, guys, did you know? Did you know that according to the Bible, using our biblical glasses, some of you that were in the room this morning might know the answer to this. I said, what did the first T-Rex eat? Okay, the first dinosaurs specifically would have eaten what? Plants, Plants because you see there was no death of animals. And right now, you might be thinking, you've got to be kidding. Obviously, T-Rex were killing machines. You know, and you might be saying, hey, you know, I've even seen the movies. You know, it's got to be true. And I have personal experience, so I know what you're talking about here. <laughs> However, the question would be, was that first meal maybe a Brachiosaurus burger or a mammoth steak? Or does the Bible tell us something different? As we looked at the scripture this morning, all animals were given plants for food at the beginning. Okay? Before the fall, there was no death and suffering. So animals would not have died. It was a paradise. It's very unlike anything that we know today. It's a reflection of the new heavens and the new earth that the Bible tells us about will have. So if Genesis is true here, then both we and the dinosaurs and the lions and tigers and bears. Okay, let me try that again. If Genesis is true here, then both we and the dinosaurs, and the lions and tigers and bears. All right, we're originally vegetarian. Again, you might be saying, you've got to be kidding, look at those sharp teeth. I mean, that's obviously designed to be a killing machine. Well, let's take a look at a particular species. Does anybody know what species this is? No, it's not a bear. But if you look at those teeth in the front, they look like they were designed to capture the prey. The teeth in the, in the back are so sharp they could cut a piece of paper. This, is a, this thing has very sharp teeth. And here's what it actually is. Okay. Now, does anybody out there want to take a wild guess about what the, the main diet of a fruit bat might be? Anybody want to go out on a limb and think about what that might be? All right, that's right. It is fruit. And guess what? So this animal that has very sharp teeth eats absolutely no meat. All right? So in this case, just having sharp teeth does not mean that something eats meat. It just means what? It has sharp teeth. That's what it means. All right, how about this guy? What species is this? Saber-toothed tiger. Or, more likely, and absolutely factually, <laughs> This is a deer that lives in Asia today. It's prevalent. It eats berries, leaves, and saplings. Absolutely no meat. Again, here's another example that sharp teeth does not mean that something eats meat. It just means what? It has sharp teeth. How about this one? I'll, I'll give you a hint. It is a bear. It's a ferocious, terrifying panda which uses those very sharp teeth in order to eat bamboo. And it comes in a lot in handy. Uh, has anybody here ever carved a pumpkin? Yeah, okay. And what did you use to carve your pumpkin? A knife, what kind of knife? Very sharp knife. Thank you, very good. A very sharp knife, it comes in handy. So I'm now going to show you a picture based on a biblical worldview that might be kind of surprising to you. Now, okay, so I, I want you to use your biblical glasses and think outside the box. Now, I do not want you to go home and tell people that the creation guy said that dinosaurs were vegetarian because later on, after the fall, they were not. T-Rex wasn't, but two-thirds of the dinosaurs actually were vegetarian. Only, only, only about a third of dinosaurs were actually carnivores, but that was after the fall. But I could give you hundreds of examples, 
hundreds of examples of animals with very sharp teeth that eat no meat. I could also give you an article from Creation Magazine where Tyke was the name of this lion. A, a guy in mid-America, in, uh, mid a farmer, thought it would be a great idea to import a, uh, a, lion, uh, a lion and have it brought onto his ranch. No it's, no, it's not a great idea. But I'll tell you one thing is this lion, when it was a cub, would not eat any meat. He even hired a vet to, to do it because he knew that his lion was going to die. They would put a little bit of blood uh, into the water just to try to wean it into eating meat, and it would refuse having that milk. This lion lived its entire life and lived a full life with not ever eating any meat. On top of that, there was a lion actually in an Italian zoo that would not eat meat. They would make spaghetti for it, meatless spaghetti, and the sauce had to have the spices just right or it would shun that away. Have you ever heard of a finicky cat? That's it. So, so please, I'm not trying to say that there is not carnivory. There was carnivory after the fall, but there, it, 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 is, it is feasible that some of these carnivorous animals didn't, well, it's biblical that they did not eat meat. All right, next question. Were dinosaurs on the ark? Well, if we take a look at the Bible, of course, we're going to get a clue. And does the Bible say that God brought every kind of animal except for dinosaurs? No. 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 That would lead us, so, so the answer is yes, they would have been on the cart. Now, the next question would be, how in the world did they all fit? I mean, you know, it seems like Noah has a space problem, doesn't it? <laughs> but again, we need to think biblically. We need to see what the Bible was. And one thing we need to do is find out how large the ark was. And the Bible even specifically tells us and the detailed descriptions of what this barge, which was like a box, in fact, the word ark kind of means box, what it looked like. And so it would be a minimum of 450 feet long and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. And do you see these people right here? Gives you an idea of how massive this barge or this vessel would have been. In fact, it would be so big that it could hold 522 full-size railroad cars. Now, that would be a train eight miles long, which you've never had to wait at the cross because it would be a really long time. But it would hold the equivalent, uh, stock cars would hold the equivalent, equivalent of 125,000 animals the size of a sheep. And only 11% of the, of, the, of the animals in the biosphere today are larger than a sheep. So it would fit a lot of animals. So it would look a little like this. Here we have some sauropod dinosaurs, if you guys can see, to give you an idea of how huge this vessel would be, OK? It looked nothing like this. <laughs> We need to get these images really out of our children's mind because what happens is when they see an image like that, they think that it's kind of a fairy tale, that it's mythological. You know, the, the, the happy animals have their heads sticking out and they're happy and the sunshine is the ark floating away. While the biblical reality is, is that God is bringing judgment on the whole earth because of evil and everything except for those who uh, were on the ark and the, the fish and the different things that were in the sea and the eight humans, everything perished. It was not a happy fairy tale time. And what we need to do is tell our kids the real history of the Bible. I don't, I don't mean to be too heavy there. I kind of got a little too heavier than I am. But, but I'll tell you, when I see those little bathtub arcs, it, it, it really just makes it seem like, hey, the Bible is a storybook. And it's not. It's a history book. And it tells the truth. However... It is true that dinosaurs are huge, you know? It seems that there is a big problem there. But did you know that only a small percentage of dinosaurs were really huge, like the ones you have in the movie? In fact, many of them were just the size of a chicken. And you don't see them in the movies too often, because if it just was like that, it wouldn't be a very scary movie, OK? So but many of them are small. Now, this is my son's former dinosaur toy, OK? And he used to uh, go around. I'd have friends come over, and he would go up into their face, and he would say, this is a life-size dinosaur. This is a life-size dinosaur. Look at my life-size dinosaur. And he would repeat it over and over again. <sighs> but I mean, I mean, is this a life-size dinosaur? 
Hmm. Got to keep in mind that all dinosaurs came out of eggs. In fact, the largest dinosaur ever discovered is about 15 inches long, slightly bigger than an American football. Okay? And they, were, they started out small. Okay? <laughs> but you've got to remember that even the big ones started out in eggs yay, yay big. Okay? So could it be, <clears throat> do you think, I mean, do you think God would bring some like old stinky grandpa dinosaurs on, to, uh, and by the way, I wasn't looking at any grandpa when I said that. But, <laughs> or do you think that he would bring some young, maybe pre-adolescent dinosaurs onto the ark that had plenty of years left, as well as plenty of breeding years left, so that they could obey the command later to, to re, uh, reproduce and multiply and, and cr cover the earth? So could it be that it was more like some young, smaller dinosaurs? I, I think that's quite feasible and probable. But then you might be going, okay, well, even if they were small, there's so many dinosaurs. In fact, scientists have categorized over 700 species of dinosaurs. But some scientists, including um, uh, Jack Horner, who is the premier dinosaur paleontologist in the world, he was actually one of the characters featured in the Jurassic Park movies, um, he actually has has a whole display at Montana State University where he says there is no way that all those dinosaur species are correct. Like for instance this one, he said, and, it, and it's reasonable, is the same species at different parts of its, uh, of its development. So we do not have 700 species, but like I said, the Bible doesn't say that God brought two of every species to the ark, he said he brought two of every kind. So we need to figure out what a kind is. Now I'm going to use something other than dinosaurs, something you're more familiar with, okay, and that's dogs. So on the left, Gibson in 2004 was the world's largest dog, and down below, I don't know if you can see that, but that's Boo Boo, who in 2007 was the world's smallest dog. Looks like Gibson's thinking about having a snack, doesn't it, you know? <laughs> but here's the thing. God said he brought two of every kind of animal, and here's the deal. Gibson and Boo Boo are both dogs. In fact, after scientists mapped the human genome not too long ago, the very next cre uh, uh, animal that they decided to, mar to figure out what their, uh, uh, to map their uh, genes was the dog. And they made a scientific discovery. They said that all dogs from Gibson down to Boo Boo all descended from a common kind, which was wolf-like, and you've probably even heard that. Well, it turns out that is true. He brought two of every kind onto the ark. And there's a study called Barominology. Um, there are a bunch of scientists trying to figure out which animals can interbreed and still have a, a fertile offspring. And they have discovered that all the dogs came from a common kind. There would also be one cat kind, like lions and tigers can interbreed and have fertile offspring. Um, there would be one dromedary kind, which would be camels and llamas, because they can interbreed and have, and we could go on and on and on. So the question that we started out with is, you know, we, we noticed that this was Triceratops, right? But see, ceratops, uh, Triceratops belongs to what they call the Ceratopsian group, I'm going to call it, of dinosaurs. Now, these are all related to Triceratops. But do you see the similarities between the way they are? You can see they all have what's called a frill in the back and those little horns protruding. And just like when you look around the room, there's people that have different physical features and stuff, but we're all a human kind, all right? This is the ceratopsian kind. So using the study of barominology, we have determined that there would be approximately 50 dinosaur kinds in order to get all of the differentiation that we now know are dinosaurs. <coughs> So that would be, simple math, about 100 dinosaurs, because it's male and female, which would be, there's plenty of room for them. Now the next question that I have for you is if, if 100 were on the ark, okay, and they came off the ark, then what happened to the others? Okay? Well, the worldwide catastrophe of the flood is that all the rest of them died. A few, very few, were buried, 
in sedimentary layers that had just the right chemical composition so that they could go through the process of permineralization and they would be turned into fossils. Those fossils that remain are the only reason that we know what, or excuse me, I shouldn't have said that, take that back, not the only reason because we're going to talk about other reasons, but they are a reason why we know what dinosaurs looked like, okay? But now, some of them have been dug up by paleontologists, a few of them have been uh, shown through erosional events. But did you know that the very first dinosaurs' bones were discovered in the 1800s? Before that, no fossils had been identified as dinosaurs. So it's kind of a relatively recent discovery, you might say. And of course, we talked today, I'm not going to spend too much time about, about the typical way that they say that fossils uh, form, that, that they were buried over millions and millions of years, and then millions of years through the process of permineralization. However, how do you explain something like this, a dinosaur graveyard, where we have a whole bunch of dinosaurs all jumbled up, um, there's a, like a dam, a former dam that broke into a ravine, and these dinosaurs were kind of, but they're also uh, fossilized with logs and clams. Now, do clams and dinosaurs live in the same environment? No, no absolutely not. And yet, here they are together. How did all of those get transported into one spot? In this case, uh, it's in Utah and Colorado. How did they get jumbled up? A very, well, probably not a flash flood, just a catastrophic, worldwide, crazy, amazing, unbelievable flood. Yeah, your flash flags in Arizona don't even hold a candle to the one in the Bible. Not even close. Um, but anyhow, so a lot of new discoveries, and I'm not going to stay too much time on this because we already caught, uh, went over this, but red blood cells have been found in dinosaur bones, which is a challenge to the millions of years. And like we said... Look at that, blood vessels. How could that last for 65 million years old? And you already saw this video, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Here's another video. This is from a triceratops horn, this tissue. Um, and, and by the way, the experiment of finding soft tissue in dinosaur bones has been repeated over and over again. This is, remember I was talking about operational science? It's been done many, many times. And I believe every time that they've done, they've dissolved the bony matrix they found. So here's the question. All this fossil evidence or, or, or this kind of thing, does it make sense of a slow and gradual millions of years or more a catastrophic worldwide flood like the Bible tells us about? Let's take a look at some other fossils, okay? Here on the left is Protoceratops. While there on the right is Velociraptor. He got a lot of great press um, in that movie. All right, and by the way, I'm just going to give, this is a free one, yeah, so those weren't velociraptors, sorry, because <laughs> velociraptors are three feet tall, the one they used is their cousin that was six feet tall, but they used the velociraptor because the name was scarier than this one, so they just, anyhow, I, won't, I, I don't know why I brought that up, <laughs> stuff like that really bothers me, but anyhow, but when you look at this, this is the way these creatures were found in what they call the matrix, in the rock, in the, in the, chem the uh, matrix that was around them. They were in exactly this position with Velociraptor's arp arm inside Protoceratops' mouth. Now, using your biblical glasses, can you see these two creatures in that position waiting to be buried for millions of years? Or even one year. They're not going to pose. They're not going to do. They're going to decompose. This seems to be evidence of a rapid burial that would only be brought by a catastrophe like we've never seen before because nothing like this has ever happened. So that is something we need to look. Now, by the way, there's only about 1,200 complete dinosaur skeletons in the uh, museums around the world today. Okay, So it is rare for fossilization in general, but dinosaurs in particular. However, there are millions of these that have been discovered and that is dinosaur tracks, okay? Now, um, has anybody ever had a, uh, a track in their backyard from maybe a wild animal? I don't, what would be a good wild animal track in Arizona? Somebody help me out, huh? Bobcat, Bobcat leaves a footprint in the backyard, okay? How many millions of years will that track remain? 
Come on, tell me how many millions of years will the track remain? I'm here. No, of course, it's, going, it's not going to remain. Now, if we got some plaster of Paris, we could go out and make a, make a cast of that and we could save it. And that's kind of the only way that these tracks could be done, is if they got buried by another layer quickly after. In this case, this is a theropod, probably a duck-billed dinosaur based on the two-toed two, uh, two uh, foot. But if you look there in the rear legs, this is a pattern of what happened. The left foot gets planted solidly while the right foot is just on its tippy toes struggling, by the way, to get uphill. Using your biblical glasses, what I see is I see a dinosaur that's become buoyant and it's trying to get up the hill, and in this case, it probably succumbed. But, and, by, and by the way, these are ripple marks for rapidly flowing water that was going in a perpendicular direction against this dinosaur. I see this as, as the death throes of a dinosaur struggling as it was uh, uh, from the flood. Now, next question, is the word dinosaur in the Bible? No, it is not. Because And the reason is, because you remember when the first dinosaur bones were discovered? Does anybody remember? I said it earlier. 1800s. In fact, the word dinosaur was invented by this fellow in 1841. The word dinosaur means terrible lizard. Okay? But keep in mind that the first English translations of the Bible came, at, it came before that, that uh, word even existed. So, of course, the word dinosaur would not be in the Bible. However, there is a word... In the Old Testament, it's another word that people used to describe something that had claws, teeth, and horns and was really scary. Does anybody know what that word might be? In Hebrew, it's tanin, but in the uh, King James Version, it was translated as dragons. It, that word appears 14 times in the Old Testament. And dragons in this Hebrew word means monstrous, scary creatures, okay? So here's the question, or, or let, let me ask you, the, oh boy, do we, do we have fishermen in, in Arizona? Does that happen? We have fishermen? F are you a fisherman? Huh, you've done it a few times? And, and are you, do you, you don't know the guy? No. 17 years. Oh, you're married? All right, awesome, awesome. Can I ask you a question, ma'am? Has he ever gone out fishing and said, I caught a fish this big, and then when he came home, it was kind of like that? Has that ever happened? You can tell the truth. You can, now, I'm not asking you, sir. You can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, she agreed with me. And, and don't worry, sir. Don't worry, sir. Every red blooded man does the exact same thing. It's called a fish story. We exaggerate our, 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 uh, our conquering. Okay, you wouldn't believe what I just did, you know, and everything. But could it be that the dinosaurs of history, and notice I said dinosaurs of history because we've done, could they also be part of the dragons of legend of fish story that has been exaggerated, which would actually make them dragons of history? So bear with me. Dragons are not just a word in the Bible. They're not just a, uh, somewhat, uh, a character in a Disney movie, okay? There are actually over 1,000 written historical accounts of men slaying dragons. In fact, they cover every continent in the world except for Antarctica. So many cultures spanning millennia, and they all tell similar stories of men slaying dragons, including Marco Polo, where we trust most everything else he wrote, but he said he slayed a dragon, okay? Similar descriptions of these dragons, both in writing and, as you'll see in a moment, artwork, match what we know about dinosaurs. So, biblical glasses on, prepare to have your mind blown, all right? This skull is from a dinosaur called Dracorex, okay? National Geographic. Um, actually hired a, an artist to draw a conception of what Draco Rex would look like, and they put it on the cover of their magazine. They called it a dragon. And if I had hired Disney to draw a dragon, would it have been much different than this? No. But that's a real dinosaur. Dinosaurs 
are, or excuse me, dragons are in the legends, like I said, on all continents, okay? We got Europe, we have them in Asia. Uh, St. George and the dragon, I was talking to somebody about this earlier today, uh, was, was a witnessed uh, dragon being slayed before it devoured the king's daughter. And there was a lot of artwork that was done about that. Even here on this continent, the Native Americans talked about this flying lizard, all right? And they drove it, they even uh, put it on their, uh, on their cave walls. And I think it's no, con uh, no coincidence that the mighty Quetzalcoatlus, which was a flying pterosaur, lived in the exact areas where these were. Let's go back into Europe, the tomb of Richard Bell. He was buried in 1496. Now, that, that is hundreds of years before the first dinosaur bones were discovered. And carved around his tomb, there, are, there is a, uh, a fish, dog, pig, and bird and this animal right here. Yeah, you're right. It is what looks to be a, uh, a uh, sauropod dinosaur, ones with the long necks and the uh, long tails. Here in, uh, in Asia, is on the top is a stone carving of a dragon, because you know, China has dragon legends, and below is an actual protoceratops matching. We go into Cambodia. This temple, dedicated in 1186 AD, which is almost 700 years before the first dinosaur bones were discovered. And if we zoom in on this particular carving, what do we see? Stegosaur. Stegosaur. It's very obvious. You can see the alternating plates on the back, the horns. 700 years before the first dinosaur bones were discovered, how did they know what a dinosaur looked like? Unless some man either at this time or before that time had done that. We have a book back there, uh, Dire Dragons. It's a, a hardcover book with beautiful photographs of artwork of dragons, and we show how it matches exactly dinosaurs that we know are for real. Humans doing artwork of dragons, or should I say dinosaurs. Just keep an open mind. Is it possible? I think so. Now, does the Bible say anything about dinosaurs? Well, perhaps. There's one guy, a guy named Job, who lived after the flood, all right? And some really bad stuff happened to him, and he was basically asking God, why? And he had his friends come and talk to him, and they gave him some bad answers. And then God finally steps in and doesn't answer him directly. He didn't say, okay, let me tell you why. But what he did is he went through creation. He said, I'm the creator. I have wisdom and power. Can you create this, Job? Can you create this? And he kind of takes him through a walk through the different crea created things, through four chapters of, of Job, where he talks about the beauty of the created things that he made. And then finally, he spends the most time in chapter 40 on a creature called Behemoth, okay? Okay. Now, he tells that basically that God created, he said, God tells Job, he said, I created behemoth, the most colossal, which would be huge. And there's speculation about what behemoth might have been. In fact, there was a footnote at the bottom of uh, the formerly biggest selling um, English translation of the Bible that used to say it was a hippopotamus or an elephant. So let's compare that with a sauropod. Okay, a sauropod, it says that behemoth eats grass. So do hippos eat grass? Yeah, plants. Elephants? How about sauropods? Actually, they do. They are herbivores. Interestingly enough, in this Fernbank Museum, um, it, they actually said grasses didn't exist at the time of dinosaurs. Unfortunately, they had to take that back because what they did, they discovered fossilized coprolite. Does anybody know what coprolite is? This is a, a piece of coprolite right here. It's a slice, okay? That's, that's what it is, okay? <laughs> and inside coprolite, what they have found is grasses. So we know that sauropods ate grasses. Okay, next. It said that it had big bones. Do elephants have big bones? Yeah. Hippos? Sauropods? Yeah, you bet. Uh, said that his tail moves like a cedar. And keep in mind the cedar trees that were used to build some of the great buildings in Jerusalem, including the, uh, the temple, were monstrous, huge, huge trees. So, does this look like a cedar tree to you? 
So could it be, could it be that behemoth might have been one of these great sauropods when God told Job about this colossal beast, the greatest of all of his creation? And he also mentions toward the end of chapter 40 that he could stand in the River Jordan at flood stage, put his head above water, and resist the current. And right now, the Jordan floods at 45 feet deep. Elephant and hippo can't do that. No animal can do that, shy of one. And that's the mighty sauropod. Next question, if they came off the ark, then where are they now? Last year, did you see any dinosaurs in the zoo? No. Now, evolutionists have a lot of theories about what happened. The most popular one that was kind of postulated in the 1970s was the asteroid impact theory. And indeed, I just want to let you know that the evidence for a huge asteroid hitting the Earth around the Yucatan Peninsula is pretty undeniable. It really is something that happened. But interestingly enough, why are the turtles, crocodiles, snakes, and for that matter, mammals, why did they not go extinct, even from an evolutionary standpoint, okay? Yet they were all, they lived and were buried with the dinosaurs, but they didn't go extinct. The bottom line is that evolutionists can't know what happened. But today, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened to the dinosaurs. <laughs> and that is, no one knows for sure, because it's something that happened in the past. We know that God created them, that there was a flood, but perhaps could the Ice Age have played a role? Now keep in mind, we're not talking about the Ice Age that lasted for millions of years. We have books by a, 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 a climate climatologist named Michael Ward, who, where he talks about how there was an ice age that lasted 500 to 700 years immediately after the flood. And the evidence is very clear for that. That would have been hard for a cold-blooded, which most scientists believe that dinosaurs were cold-blooded, large reptile. Do you think disease might have been a factor? Because there's been other animals that have gone extinct by that. How about a lack of food source right after the flood when everything's torn up? Could that have been a factor? But I, I, you know, there's been a lot of animals that have gone extinct even today, but I would like you to consider another idea using your biblical glasses. And that is, could man have had a role in this? You know, later on, God said that you could eat meat, you know, and we're all very, most of us are pretty thankful for that, but is this a scene that is possible? You know, there, there have been a single man with only armed with a spear take down an elephant by himself as long as he knows where what's called the kill zone. My fishermen might have heard of a kill zone. There are certain places in there that can be fatal blows with just one strike of a spear, okay? So, and man, let me ask you guys, since I've already picked on you, if you came home tonight and there was not one of these cute little dinosaurs out there, but a real dinosaur in your backyard, what's going to happen? You're, well, you're going to scream. You're going to tell him he needs to take care of it or he's not having dinner, right? No, no, I'm having dinner because I'm going to take care of it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> he's having dinner. And that was kind of my point because every red-blooded man, man would not only want to protect his family, Maybe protect his village, not allow it to go through its uh, garden, you know, destroying their food supply and everything. But what about this? You ready? What if they kill and slay the mighty dragon and write it down in one of those 1,000 accounts of dragons being slayed by men? You with me? And wouldn't you like that trophy, that head up above your fireplace? Oh, she would. Yeah, most women are like, no, 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 wouldn't want that. But... So I just, want to, I just want to give you a taste of what the whole idea of dinosaurs. And if anybody ever asks you if you believe in the age of dinosaurs, I'd like you just to suggest, say, no, I believe in five ages of dinosaurs. You know, first, they were designed. In other words, in the beginning, God created all of them. And then the largest disaster of all time. Okay, these five start with the letter D. I didn't tell you that. The biggest disaster, which, by the way, was the fall followed by the second biggest disaster, the flood in history. And then by their extinction of those that came off of the ark, they went extinct and now they're discovered, okay? The summary kind of, in fact, you can even use dinosaurs in order to kind of go through a summary of what the Bible tells us about, about why 
there are dinosaurs, almost like you can use them as a, a tool to talk about it because I don't want you to be scared of dinosaurs, okay? It's something that you can do. But remember, we need to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And if somebody comes up to us and we're sharing the gospel and we say, hey, Jesus loves you, but what if they've been taught that the Bible can't be true because science has proven? And what if they have lots of answers about so many things, including dinosaurs? If we're not ready with an answer, it can have an eternal impact on their soul. And if they come home to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and they don't have an answer, I hope you can see how important that is. That's why we need to have a defense for our faith. So evolution usually gets credit for forming these dinosaurs over millions of years through the process of natural selection and random mutations. But I'd like us as believers to know that dinosaurs are God's creation and that we need to give the creator glory for all that he has made, including these great creatures. So appreciate your time. Um, now, we were promised to go ahead and do a question and answer time. Is it okay we just transition into that? All right. Um, I do need to let you know that there are rules for question and answer, okay? Um, the, uh, the first one is, is that your question needs to be about the origins issue, okay? Specifically related to creation. Uh, if you have a question about eschatology, soteriology, I'm just going to refer you over to Pastor Craig. So try to keep it on topic. It can be that broad topic. There are a lot of topics, but it needs to be on the creation, evolution issue, origins, what the Bible says, what science says. That was rule number one. Rule number two is the harder one that some people don't get, and that is that your question needs to be in the form of a question. <laughs> I'm not going to explain what I mean by that, but if you don't do that, I will perhaps interrupt you and try to ask you what your question is, okay? So, do you understand the rules? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start out with uh, uh, the first question. I know some people are kind of shy, you know, like, like this. So let's skip the first question and go right to the second one. Who has that? <laughs> Just put your hand up. Yes, sir. Nice and loud, although I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Um, I, I might be breaking rule number two. Then I'm don't. Gonna... Yeah, okay, so your, your question is the great incongruence, and I think you're talking about the great unconformity, oh, maybe? That's the one. Yeah, the great unconformity. Okay, and the question was about, what about the unconformity? Um, does that have a role to play in the dinosaurs at all, or is that more towards um, mammals? Okay, so his question was, does the great unconformity have anything to do with dinosaurs, or is it about mammals? Okay, now, what we have to do is define what the great unconformity is. <laughs> How many people in this room know what it is? And I have, a, I have an estimate of a percentage that I'm going to show you right now of how many people know what the great unconformity is. Would you raise your hands if you honestly know what it is? I, I was pretty, I was, I was almost exactly right. I said 5%, so I was pretty close. All right, so the great unconformity is something I am not an expert on. Oh, uh, wait, we have a geologist here. Or we did this morning. Oh, you've been told by your wife there. You know what the great unconformity is. Do you not? Oh, my. Okay, we better stop that. It's not that. Okay, anyhow, it's basically the base layer, okay, compared to the sedimentary layers that are on top. You know, some call it the K value, and there's different things. And, 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 and I'm cautiously not going to be too detailed on this because, to be honest, I don't have a great, uh, a great answer on that, although I do believe that it is covered in uh, chapter 10 of the answers book. So do try to get that. Um, I would say it doesn't really have anything really to do with dinosaurs in particular or mammals. It's just that rock was doing a certain thing there and then all of a sudden the sedimentary locks did something very different. So there's an unconformity from everything from the base up. And I'm starting to get bored with the question or the answer so I probably will move on. So I know that wasn't a great answer but I would say generally no. All right, another question. Yes, ma'am. I have to get closer. What? What happened to the dinosaurs? Oh, 
oh, what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, they, they did go extinct. Oh, yeah, they did go extinct. But perhaps, like mom and dad will talk to you about this maybe later on, perhaps some of them were hunted by men. And that's kind of a, a different kind of thing, but perhaps some of them were killed in hunting. Maybe some. Techni okay, wait, I heard dad. You said it too loud. You said technically alligators are dinosaurs? No, they're not. Sorry. No. no. Sorry. I'm just being particular. You, should, you said it quietly just to her. <clears throat> I just want to let you know that all, dino all dinosaurs have columnar legs, okay? We have columnar legs, meaning that our weight is focused on vertical shafts of legs, okay? Crocodiles and dinosaurs do this thing, which puts them in a different class. So they, there are no dinosaurs like the crocodile or the alligator. They have some similarities, some characteristics, but they're not really dinosaurs. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So his question was that this morning I gave you an example of a rock from a volcanic lava dome that was sent into a potassium argon dating lab and got th three very divergent ages, is what they reported, while the actual age was completely different. And so your question is, why? And so what we're talking about is radioisotope dating. Okay, a lot of people just call it uh, carbon dating. That is one form. You can use carbon, you can use radioactive carbon, you can use uh, potassium argon and uh, um, uranium lead, there are different ones. Potassium argon is used more than the other ones because it's cheaper. This is a good reason. So anyhow, let me see, how can I answer that question? And your question is basically why is there an incongruence or, or a difference between, between the actual age and what they calculated? All right, good question. Uh, let me see if I can illustrate this. By the way, <clears throat> the answer to this question is in chapter four of the answers book. But I will give you just kind of a quick thing. Uh, I'll ask you the question, but I want everybody in the room to listen as I ask you the question. I want everybody to think about this question. Are you guys all thinking about this question? Okay, here it comes. Okay, let's say you come home tonight and you walk up to your house and you hear water running. And I'm not just talking about a little water. You hear the pipes running. Right? And you run into the house expecting to find a broken pipe or something happen. And, and you can't hear it, but it's upstairs, okay? I don't care if you have an upstairs. In my story, you have an upstairs. Okay, you go upstairs into the bathroom, and the bathtub spout is going full force, okay? Now, you take your one-gallon pail that you keep in the bathroom, because we all keep a one-gallon pail in our bathroom. In my story, you put it underneath the faucet, and you time it, and you see it takes 60 seconds or one minute to fill the one-gallon bucket with the water coming out of the faucet. You guys listening? Okay. All right, now, you later measured that there are 15 <coughs> gallons of water in the tub. Now, I have a question for you. How long did it take to put, those, put that water in the tub? 15 minutes. Do you agree with him? Yes. So far. You agree with him? No. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, right. We forgot. You made a lot of assumptions there. Number one, when was the water turned off? Was the water turned up and down? Was the plug open? Did we start out with no water, or was there a little bit of water? Was that one gallon pail taken to remove some water? Was there a crack in the tub? Okay, now, what I did is I gave you a metaphorical way of understanding that the assumptions that they use in radioisotope dating are basically that the decay rate of the radioisotope has never changed in the past, while we have three pieces of evidence that you can read about in the uh, answers book, as well as other sources on our website that show that the decay rate of radioisotopes was rapidly increased sometime in the past. And, uh, and then also the, the amount of the, like for instance in carbon-14, okay, during the nuclear blasts of the 1950s when they were testing atomic bombs, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere took a spike because it did stuff in the atmosphere that increased it. They have to make adjustments when they do carbon dating based on that. So there have been times in the past, not just the 1950s, but before, where we have evidence that the radioisotopes had different rates. So the assumptions are that everything that happens today has always happened in the past. But the Bible tells us something ter ter 
amazingly happened with the worldwide flood. And could that have been a factor in increasing the uh, radioisotope uh, age? I also want to tell you something about carbon dating in particular. You guys remember doing carbon dating maybe in school where you used the half-life? Okay, so let's say I had this much carbon-14 after one half-life, which is 5,740 years, I would have half that amount. After another 5,740 years, I had one-fourth. After another 5,740 years, I have one-eighth. And eventually, it's going to get so minuscule, you can't measure it. And the, the, the way you do it becomes uh, immeasurable. But that happens, depending upon which scientists you talk, between 50 and 90,000 years. So carbon dating can't give you millions of years. And no true scientist that understands that ever claims to have carbon dating that is in the millions of years from, from carbon dating. You have to use other radioisotopes that have a longer half-life, such as potassium argon and some of the others. Okay, I probably put some people to sleep, including myself, but no. yes, sir? Dave? Yes, that's you. Yeah. Uh, Right, right, right. Sure. Okay. All right. So cha chapter five of the answers book has the answer here. How can <laughs> we see distant stars in a young universe? It's a very common question. I already answered that question this morning, so why don't you stand up and give them the answer? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. All right. So some of your que so your his question was if if galaxies are billions of light years away, which is it, it appears by all scientific measures that is the truth. The, you know, it's, the Bible says that God's majesty is in his creation, and even the heavens declare his majesty. So the fact that it would be huge isn't too surprising. You know, God's a big God. He made a big universe. So, but nonetheless, the measurements that we make would be that they are very, very far away. So how could light come in there? You, so there are basically, you've got to remember one thing. And that is that the secular scientists also have a starlight and time problem. It's called the horizon problem. Okay? And for, for example, that's one. And then another one is that the cosmic background radiation, which we see throughout space, is equal no matter where you look. You turn that way, it's the same temperature, that way, that way. They don't have enough time. Even with a uh, 15 billion year old uh, universe, not enough time for that energy to spread at the speed of light, which is the fastest way that heat can travel. Okay? So they got problems. We got problems. We don't understand them. Cosmology is a very difficult thing. But I will give you one of the two major uh, answers that have been developed in cosmology to explain that. And it's basically called gravitational time dilation. Okay? And that is that Einstein predicted that uh, gravity would have an impact on time. In fact, there's a lot of science fiction movies and books written about this. Uh, but time, time actually, a, a clock in Denver clicks faster than a clock at sea level because there's less gravity there. Clocks on our GPS satellites tick significantly faster to the point where they have to completely correct mathematically that, those, those clocks going faster or else we'd end up at, at Walmart instead of Target or something, you know? So, the, uh, so here's the concept is that in low gravity, time is going much faster. On day four, which you just mentioned, God said that he created the heaven and the moon stars. But also in the Old Testament, I believe it's 14 times, uh, God says that he stretched out the heavens like a tent. He stretched out the heavens. So could it be that on day four, when he stretched out the entire universe, and we have a great God that could do that, could it be that the, low gr the high gravity here, time was going at a different speed than gravity out into the universe, and it was going very fast? Now, I know that right now you're trying to think of the do 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 but that's what cosmology is. Cosmology, in a way, is not a pure science because we have light and rays coming from distant things, and or we can't go and get a piece of star and bring it into the lab and test it. We can only make uh, kind of postulates about what's really going on out there. 
I truly feel like I'm losing people here because I'm going too high. Yes, sir. Okay, his question is, is there any proof or evidence of man and dinosaurs that walk together? We have one of our most visited articles on our website is called Arguments Creationists Should Not Use. And a lot of the main ministries come to that and get our science's opinions on it. Unfortunately, what you just said is one of them. Now, I know somebody asked me about this here in the church that in Rose something, Texas, if somebody can help me. Anyhow, in Texas, there is a, a fellow there that claims that he has a dinosaur footprint, and he does, and he said that it's superimposed with a man's footprint. Uh, all of the major creation organizations do, do uh, completely do not think that it's definitive that that's a man, not even enough to even consider it. However, I do want to let you know there is evidence of man and dinosaurs at the same time in some of the things I just covered in here, including artwork, which I think is even better explanation. If artwork of what they call dragons match dinosaurs, I think that's even more compelling than a, than a dinosaur. And keep in mind, man and dinosaur did live together, and you would think their fossils have to be together, but there's a lot of animals that live with man that you don't have man in together. There's this animal called a coelacanth, which they say went extinct 65 million years ago, and they call it like the dinosaur fish until, I think it was 1928, 1936, I'm forgetting which, where a Japanese scholar went and caught a coelacanth. Been extinct for 65 million years and they went, whoops, now they've caught a bunch of them and even have put them in fish markets and people are eating them. So they were never fossilized together, but the coelacanth is, is still alive in, even today. All right. Yes, young man, yes. Yes, you. Oh, did Pangea exist? What an awesome question. I will let you know that that covered in chapter 11 of the answers book, okay? So Pangea, if you guys know what Pangea is, that's basically the theory that all of the, or most all of the land was in one place. And right now through the, the idea of continental drift or plate tectonics, what we do is we see underneath the Atlantic Ocean, the largest mountain range in the world, which is called the Atlantic Ridge, it's very volcanic, and it makes kind of a big S like this. And then when you look at the western and eastern hemisphere land masses, they seem to fit together like a puzzle piece. Okay? This science, by the way, wasn't until like the 1970s, so anybody that has a little bit of gray hair like me probably might not have learned that in high school because it wasn't accepted, but now it's quite accepted. Uh, at the same time, it's, this is very interesting. A guy named John Baumgartner, okay, who was a scientist, you know who he is? <laughs> Your last name is what? Oh, first name is John. Well, this guy has a really funny name, Baumgartner. But anyhow, he worked for Los Alamos Laboratories using your taxpayers' money. And he was, he was given the task to figure out basically what's going on in the world seismically. And he looked at all the, si the uh, tectonic plates, saw that their motion, it took him a year to program at the time the world's largest computer called Terra was the name of it. At the end, he put all his data in in order to try to explain how the mountains and continents exist today, if indeed plate tectonics and that, that whole idea. And what he discovered was fascinating. Based on the laws of physics, which are firmly in plate, that all of that motion had to happen in one year. He didn't come up with that conclusion. The computer model showed one year. It was, it's been published in scientific journals that it's named CPT, Catastrophic Plate Tectonics. And it is a very respected theory. And let me explain to you why it is. Um, let's say that you drove your car into a concrete wall like this one, let's say, at five miles an hour, what would happen to the car? It would have a little scratch in the bumper. It would kind of bounce back because they got those really cool bumpers, right? Same car, 50 miles an hour. Would there be a difference? Yeah. Yes. Of course, the hood's going to go like this. That's the laws of physics, of momentum. In order to get the huge continents, this is what he did when he put in the plates, 
and he saw the Himalayas, the Andes, and those huge mountain ranges. It had to be done by a collision that went really forcefully and quick, not slow one centimeter a year, which is the current rate the, the continent, the plates move today. So here's the question. Does the Bible say anything about what I just said? Maybe. Maybe. Because on day three, remember, it says that God brought all the waters together in one place and land appeared. That implies that land was in one place. Because is the water in one place today? No, we have two major oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. So if land was in one place, then when God said that he did this tremendous thing and he opened the fountains of the great deep, could those be the Atlantic Ridge volcanoes? Could those also be part of the fountains of the great deep? When a volcano erupts, 50% of, of what it emits is steam, which is water in a different form. So could it be that Pangaea, or that supercontinent, split apart as part of that, subducted underneath the oceans, and then as it collided on the other sides and around the ring of fire in the Pacific Ocean, create the great and massive mountain ranges that are here today that weren't there before. And remember when I told you about the marine fossils that were in the layers of the highest mountains in the, rain, rain in the world? Could that have been, that force, sudden force, not continents going one centimeter a year, but a, only taking one year. Keep in mind, the, the flood was one year and seven days, okay? In the first half, everything was on. In the second half, the land was appearing, and it was coming out of the oceans. So the Bible actually implies that that's a possibility, that that could have been one of the uh, things that happened when God was doing the flood. Okay, so maybe like two more, because we're a little over the time we were promised. Um, yes, sir. Was there a moment in your studying where <coughs> you knew that God was the creator? Was there a moment in my studying where I knew God was the creator? Wow. Never had that question before. I'm kind of puzzled thinking about it. I'll, I'll be honest. I knew in my heart of hearts that God was the creator probably at a very young age. I came to know the Lord at the age of 19. At the, at the, in my late 20s and 30s, I was already um, speaking in churches. I was, I, I was a, a speaking uh, pastor at my church, or a teaching pastor, I should say. <clears throat> and I believe that God could have used millions of years. I've been taught all my life that that was the case. And then in 1999, I heard a presentation by somebody that uh, was somebody that I knew, and they just had read a book, and they made a little presentation not quite like what I did today, but for me, it changed my life. I saw, that it was basically a comparison of the evolutionary model to the creation model. And I saw some of these things about geology, and it was like lighting tinder. I was a fire. Because then I could say, wait, this Bible that I'm actually teaching in church, you're saying it's true all the way through? My worship went through the Lord for my Lord and Creator because then, so it wasn't that I didn't believe he was a creator, but I guess you could say I kind of didn't. But then when I believed the Bible was true, it, it changed my life, and that's one of the reasons that I continue to do this over and over again because I want to see, because I, I, I keep getting testimonies. There's people in this room, hopefully, that had a, sim, a similar experience and that it might change their life, and hopefully, I will say, change other people's lives you share it with other people. Because here's the thing, I'm just here for a, for a couple sessions. You've heard me twice today, okay? I'm going to leave. If you get equipped with information and you start learning this stuff, it could change their lives. Even somebody that doesn't know Christ, that doesn't believe he's a creator, that believes evolution is a fact, if the Holy, if the Holy Spirit can lead them and you into a conversation that is respectful and gentle, because 1 Peter 3, I, I do want to bring this up. 1 Peter 3.15, that verse I've repeated over and over again. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But the rest of it is do it with gentleness and respect. And let me see if I can demonstrate with Pastor Craig here. Um, I, I fly a lot in order to do these presentations. And uh, I, I choose the middle seat because then I have two people to talk to. One of them is, on average, scientifically, I'm kidding, uh, one of the two sitting on me is giving me the international symbol of don't talk to me, which is put earphones in. 
sometimes, but I'm always, when I sit down, I go, hi, are you traveling for business or, you know, and all this, and I do that stuff and, and everything, but I, I will oftentimes get into conversations. So let's pretend that you're sitting next to me tomorrow, I'm going to be on Southwest Airlines flight, whatever it is, okay? And he's sitting next to me, and you know, I start up a conversation, and, you know, what do you do for a living? Let's just say you're an insurance salesman, just for me, okay? <laughs> he's an insurance salesman, I go, Fascinating. I probably won't do that because that's a little too sarcastic. But I go, oh really? Like, but I will. I will ask him questions, and then I'll try to find something interesting, and we'll talk about what he does for a living. He said, well, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I actually travel around. I speak to churches, and I work for an organization that employs PhD scientists, and we talk about how the physical evidence in the world supports the historical account of the Bible. And then I just look in your eyes and find out how that's going to be received. You know. And there are percentages, there's some of them that like, okay, I'm getting out my headphones, you know, but some, some people will actually engage with me, okay? Now, I have two choices on how I'm going to maybe engage with him. One thing I could do is I could say, you know, because I'm going to assume, let's just assume that he is an evolutionist. And I, and I could say, oh, really? Let me tell you about polystrate fossils. <laughs> Let me tell you about how fast erosion. Let me tell you about fossil fossil. Let me show you the dinosaur bones, okay? And I want to let you know, I've read the answers book so I can win the argument. But I'm not going to win the person. I need to use gentleness and respect. So my approach is going to be more like, well, can you tell me what specific facts convinced you that evolution is true? Okay? Then he's going to start giving me some information that I'm going to try to have a gentle and respectful conversation. Because here's the thing. Evolutionists are not stupid. Okay? And a lot of Christians use this attitude of, you believe in evolution? <laughs> Takes more faith, you know, than what I got. And, and, you know, I agree that is true, but that is not the approach we need to use. Evolutionists are using the logic that they've been provided, and there is logic behind what they believe might make you think that that's kind of funny to have somebody in my position to say that. But they are just going by what they've been told. And the only way that we can begin to get the wheels going is to use gentleness and respect. Okay? Now, we are 15 minutes past the time you were promised to go, so I want to be respectful to you. Uh, please go ahead and check out the tables. Uh, if you guys have any further questions, please let me know. Anything else you have in mind there? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right, gang, some things to chew on. How many of you have your hamster is running right now? And the encouraging thing is, guys, what would next steps look like to engage further, to learn more, to become more equipped, to take some next steps in a, in a life-giving, life-changing journey? As Scott said, uh, there's resources back there. We encourage you to stop back and take a look at some of those on your way out. And I want to remind you as well, guys, as the church, we're praying about the opportunity to go to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum back in Kentucky as part of fall break. Information is available now. You can know where we're staying and have some uh, flight details and things that could help you plan your trip. So that's coming up fall break, want to encourage you. Uh, we've had an amazing uh, interest. I, Chance, I don't know where you are. Is it like 80 something? 80? Over 90 people have expressed interest in, in going on this trip. And so it'd be a really fun adventure for our church family if the Lord would open that door for you or put that on your heart. So thanks so much for coming and spending time with us tonight. Join me as we pray and we'll um, just conclude our evening. Father, thank you so much for what's been a really encouraging, edifying, equipping Sunday, Lord, what a full, amazing day, full of truth, full of life, full of hope, full of understanding. And we just ask and pray, Lord God, that by your spirit, you would just take what we've learned today, establish it in the, the depths of our heart. And I pray that you would as well light a fire under us, Lord, and cause us to want to study deeper, to take next steps. Maybe for some, they'll come to meet Jesus for the very first time. Maybe for others, Lord God, we'll take more steps to become more equipped to have the kind of conversations that Scott was talking about, maybe on an airplane, maybe, Lord, across the table at lunch, 
with others that you've placed in our lives. But Lord, we pray that you would allow this to be a powerful stepping stone. And so we give you the glory for it. Bless us as we make our way home. Bless these wonderful families. Go before them as they begin a new week. Would you prepare the way? We pray that you would be glorified. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Scott Gillis, thanks again for a fun full weekend.